as the water flows along, when it flows, it'll it'll sort of still on this side and you'll get deposits. And then as it spills over here, and we're building a face for it to spill across, so it won't erode away as quite so easily. And then as it leaves, it leaves at right angles to the weir, which points roughly, if I'm about halfway, what I like with this type of weir is for it to point halfway to point roughly at the end of the next weir or just a little in. So it's just tilting the water out just a little bit. Each time it goes over a weir, the water is directed out just slightly. We saw huge breakdowns in the pool and riffle systems uh, because of the massive change in hydrology. And through to uh, the 50s into the 60s, what we began to see were these huge amounts of gravel and sand and even up to cobble and boulders starting to move slowly through the system. Now, of course, the Solum is a very low gradient, very meandering system. So you can see on this map here very, very clearly how these piles of gravel have been moving down the river for years and years and years and have piled up and piled up. They're piling up even along some of the straight stretches. All of the bends have these huge piles of gravel. These are all moving slowly. This one here was very interesting. This pile here filled up to the point where it actually pushed the solum out of a channel. This is where the solum used to run right here. It actually pushed through, filled up so high here that it pushed the solum through, and now the solum comes down through this area here. And uh, what happened then, of course, this is, used to be Portuguese Creek. It was just a little narrow three-meter uh, stream, which is now holding the entire solum. So the incredible amount of uh, erosion that, it, that occurred over a few years, started pulling trees in and threatening homes and septic fields and these kinds of things. So we then went in and did uh, uh, the bank stabilization project at the Wiedemann's place, the uh, project we called the Portuguese Creek Project. And that took place right in front of Wiedemann's here, and it was to protect this bend uh, from this new volume of flow that was coming through there. A project like this, uh, when we sit down and we look at budgeting for it, uh, we look at the excavator time, the amount of rock, um, we look at the design that we're working from, and we make all of the estimations to, to, to move forward. The original estimate uh, budget uh, for this project was about $500,000. Um, if we had proceeded with that project, uh, uh, I, I suspect that it would have even cost a lot more than that because we would have we wouldn't have done it as a nonprofit society because it was so massive. Um, we would have wanted uh, the regional district or the province to take it on. The minute that you have uh, a government agency begin to do this kind of work, of course, there are now levels of supervision. There are levels of liabilities. There are levels of 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 uh, kind of bureaucratic structure where where the cost actually of the project becomes exponential. That's the beauty of a nonprofit society doing this kind of work because we get discounts from our suppliers, we uh, get donations from landowners, we get this incredible volunteer support. So we really carve a huge amount of dollars right off the top. And of course, the only people who are paid on a project like this, I'm paid a small amount. But our hydrologist is paid, our excavator operator is paid, and the company that supplies the, the, the materials. There are no, these, not these other levels of bureaucratic uh, um, personnel that have to be paid on a project like this. And we tend to move things along and work with the land, work with uh, the materials. We read the budget day by day, see how we're doing, scale back if we have to. We're very nimble that way because we're a small organization. Again, when agencies are involved, often plan A is plan A, it's stuck to it. And often, as we all know, um, government projects tend to go well over what they, were, what they were budgeted for. So 
say we started with a $500,000 budget, that could have gone to a million dollars to do that project. We did this project for $55,000. Weirs are put together by the, uh, the excavator, but really he can just place the, the main rocks and some of the minor rocks and doesn't really get it fitted together tight. So what Dave's doing down there is he's filling all of the holes and uh, providing an, an apron for scour on the downside so that when it spills over, it doesn't scour down and destabilize the big rocks that form the crest of the weir. The crest of the weir, uh, it directs flow. As water comes into the weir, it leaves the weir at a right angle. You'll notice the weirs are angled a little bit upstream on their outside end. So as well as providing a roughness element along this side of the bank, which tends to move the flow out, uh, they, each weir directs the flow out towards the center slightly. So when you have a series of these, it's all, all directing flow more out towards the center, then you end up with the fast, deep flow off the tip of the weirs instead of next to the bank eroding it. Yeah, we're standing here uh, in uh, what used to be just a little, little old Portuguese creek and is now the full Solemn River. And this uh, particular weir field has gone through two winters now. We're just uh, poised for the third one. And this thing has performed very, very well. And we've actually turned active erosion into active deposition. If I reach down, just with my fingers, under my feet, this is, uh, this is river sand. This is uh, um, very fine material that is now being deposed here. Whereas before we put this, this uh, field in, this was actively eroding. It was actually taking material away. Now it's actively leaving material, which is exactly what we intended to do, and it's working perfectly. In behind each weir, um, we get good deposition. We actually... Uh, and there's actually fish swimming around on the, on the toes of these weirs. We've actually created little pockets of habitat behind each of these weirs. And that's why you see the wood in there. The wood is part of the habitat features, um, encouraging fish to, uh, to rear here and uh, um, spend that year that the coho and trout need to spend in the fresh water. 